We'll start with the next talk, Cyber War on the Horizon. Uh, Stefan Schumacher, I'm looking forward to the talk. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, first, I would like to welcome you to my talk, which is titled uh, Cyber War on the Horizon. Uh, before I start with the actual talk, I will give a short introduction of myself. I'm working as a security consultant, and I'm mainly focusing on social engineering, security awareness, counterintelligence, and security management. I'm uh, the president of the Magdeburg Institute of Security Research and editor of our institute's journal, and I'm also um, the president of the Magdeburg Academic Society of Security Policy Studies. And I've, I've been asked by uh, some uh, political science groups to give some introductions into cyber war because it is currently being discussed in political science, and I gave them some kind of technical introduction. And now I would like to give some kind of political in, uh, introduction into cyber war to uh, the technical folks available here at DeepSec. Um, the talk is, is divided into three parts. Um, the first one is the discussion of the term war. Uh, the second one is uh, a short introduction into political topics of cyber war. And um, the third one is a short overview of currently available attack vec uh, vectors and how uh, and what the future might bring on the term cyber war. Um, cyber war is currently a big hype in the media, in the IT security scene, of course also in the military, it's about war, and so the military is interested in it. It's also um, a big hype in the politics, and of course it's also being discussed by political science. Um, think of Stuxnet, uh, think of what happened to Georgia and Estonia when they got in conflict with Russia. Uh, there was uh, a big uh, denial of uh, service attack on South Korea some years ago. But uh, in my opinion, uh, we should discuss the quest question if it is really possible to wage a war in cyberspace. Um, so I will give you uh, some kind of theoretical, political, or military science discussion. I will not uh, dig into the deepest uh, technological or technical uh, discussion. Um, when analyzing the term cyber war, uh, we should take a look at uh, the words that are used. Uh, cyber war is composed of cyber and war, and cyber comes from cyberspace. Cyberspace has a technical and a social dimension. Uh, the technical dimension means there is a lot of hardware with some software, and I guess I don't have to explain more to uh, the attendance of DeepSec. That's what DeepSec is usually discussing when discussing uh, cyberspace. Um, cyberspace also has a social component, a social dimension. Uh, it is a space where people communicate and live together. Think of communities like Second Life, uh, Facebook, Usenet, MySpace, and so on. That is discussed by social science and psychology, and I'm working on uh, social engineering, security awareness, and such, and I'm discussing that topic in social engineering and security awareness. Um, the second term is war, and that's what I'm interested in discussing here. There is not one single definition of what a war is. Um, the first uh, source to look up when discussing a word is, of course, Wikipedia. So I've chosen the definition of war by Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia sees, says that a war is an organized violent conflict of extreme aggression between at least two groups with mortality. But there's also another very, very, very famous definition of war. Uh, before I start with that definition, I would like to give an introduction to uh, Karl von Clausewitz. I would like to introduce Karl von Clausewitz. Um, he was born in 1718 in Magdeburg, where I'm from. Um, he joined the Prussian army in 1792, and he joined the Prussian military, military academy in Berlin in 1801. Uh, he rose to become the aide of General Scharnhorst, who reorganized the Prussian army in 1806 when Prussia was defeated by Napoleon and his French army. Actually, he became a general and director of the Prussian Military Academy. And the Prussian Military Academy was a scientific academy to educate Prussian officers, like it is common in almost all uh, modern armies nowadays. Um, Clausewitz uh, died of cholera in 1831, and one year after his death, his book On War was published by his widow. Uh, On War is a book that discusses um, a theoretical dialectical, uh, or uh, on, on War is a book on, of a uh, dialectical theoretical discussion of war. So he's the first one who made a scientific analysis of what a war is. 
um, he laid a focus on strategy, tactics, and uh, he also uh, coined the term fog of war, which is used nowadays through all kind of information warfare and even uh, is used by computer games as Warcraft and so on. Uh, so his book on war is the book on war, the one single Bible on the term war. Um, Karl von Clausewitz defined war or ex, uh, explained that war is nothing but a duel on an extensive scale. He said, war, therefore, is an act of violence intended to compel our opponent to fulfill our will. This is the essence of war to Clausewitz. He also said, war is a mere continu continu continuation of policy by other means. It has no purpose by itself. That means that war is nothing that is done just to have a war, but war also follows a higher aim. War is some kind of... of political instrument. It is embedded into a political strategy, and that's important, also important when discussing cyber war. Um, the objectives of war to a military leader or to politics are to either achieve limited aims or to disarm an opponent and render him politically helpless or military impotent. That means war is there to, to, to uh, uh, suppress or press your will onto uh, your opponent. Uh, he also laid a big focus on, on strategy and tactics. Uh, since I'm using these terms also in my, my talk, uh, I would like to introduce them. Um, tactics is the theory of the use of military forces in combat. Strategy is the theory of the use of combats for the object of the war. So winning a single battle is a question of tactics, but winning a war is a question of strategy. Uh, occupying a country and building a new nation is also a strategy. For example, there is a big discussion cu uh, currently going on uh, what strategy stands behind the invasion in Afghanistan and Iraq because uh, the political leaders don't have any strategy for occupying the country and building a new nation. And whenever a war is waged or a war started and ended, uh, strategy is the thing uh, where all military leaders and all other means of war have to uh, orientate on. So without strategy, there is no, no, no aim that the war has to fulfill or can fulfill. Uh, so to, to use uh, the Clausewitz theory on cyber war, it means cyber war is a mere continuation of policy by other means. It has no purpose by itself. Cyber war must be embedded into a political strategy to render an opponent military impotent. So uh, the next step to discuss is if, if is if it is possible to render an opponent military impotent by just doing cyber attacks, cyber war, or electronic warfare. Uh, I think that just doing some hacking can be considered a skirmishing, but uh, not as a strategy or even a complete war. So just hacking around is, might be fun for some people. It also can be considered a skirmishing in military terms, but um, with the lack of strategy, it cannot be considered to be a war. Uh, in my opinion, cyber war currently is a part of conventional warfare on tactical levels. So it might be used to support a conventional war, but it cannot be a war on its own or even a class of war on its own. Um, there is one... Uh, yesterday I gave an, an interview to a, a guy from the radio and you had a discussion on how cyber war might change um, the fundamental Clausewitzian paradigm or a paradigm, that, a paradigm that has been used in military for several hundred years. Um, that paradigm is, it is easier to defend than to attack. Whenever a military group is trying to attack a fortress or something like that, there is the rule of thumb that, uh, that there have to be at least three times more attackers than defenders. And the, the attacker has to, to uh, put in more energy and more men and more machines and more people to attack a defended uh, fortress. Um, the defender is always in advance because he has uh, well-established log logistics, he has knowledge of the area, and he can avoid the fog of war. He has more information about the area he is living in, uh, he knows where his uh, fortresses are, he knows uh, the range of his weapons and where he can shoot and fire at. Um, when talking of cyber war or cyber attacks, this paradigm changes because uh, in cyber war or cyber defense, the defender has to defend all system and to doing that or for uh, accompanying that aim, he has to find and patch all vulnerabilities. The attacker only has to find one vulnerability. So the defender is in charge to defend his, his whole systems with a lot of unknown uh, security issues and he has to find them all and close those security holes. But the attacker only has to find one vulnerability. 
um, there can be uh, an, an, um, statistic uh, formula can be used to do some statistical analysis of that topic. And um, there is a paper issued by the University of Dresden. Uh, they have done that. They've created a mathematical formula on uh, where you can uh, uh, calculate how many defenders you will need to defend the system and how many attacker it will require to find one security uh, hole to take over the system. And as a rule of thumb, you can say you will need 10 times more defenders than attackers. So uh, I said once in a discussion that um, a 14-year-old Pakistani script kiddie might be able to shut down the United States Air Force and start a cyber war. That's what might be happening in the future. And this will have important political implications. The politics and the armies are currently discussing that topic. topic and um, the military leaders and politicians are, of course, afraid that this thing might be happen. Um, I will now give a short overview on political implications of that topic. Um, when discussing uh, war and warfare, the public international law applies. Um, unfortunately, there is no international treaty available that establishes a legal definition for an act of cyber aggression. All those treaties have been made uh, in the beginning of the First World War or after the end of the Second World War. So yeah, all, all treaties are about conventional warfare. Um, the law of armed conflict, also known as international humanitarian law, applies to all warfare. There are two parts of these laws called jus ad bellum and jus ad bello, which is Latin and means justice to war and justice in war. Justice to war means how to proceed to a state of war. When are states allowed um, to, to uh, start a war against another state? Actually, in, in uh, all these uh, treaties, the term war is never used. And therefore, for example, in the United Nations Charter, uh, uh, no wars uh, apply or no wars happen or take place. They only use uh, the word of armed conflict. Uh, so this use ad bellum has to discuss when you are allowed or when a country is allowed to defend against cyber aggression and to um, to get such a law it is also possible or it is also uh, required to get a definition of what a cyber aggression is uh, and uh, the second uh, point of that law, uh, law of armed conflict, is uh, justice in war. These are the rules of how to conduct a war. Uh, the most known. Uh, Laws of justice in war are, for example, the Geneva Convention or the uh, law of the Red Cross, for example, that uh, medics uh, carrying a Red Cross shall not be attacked. And this has also, this law has also to be, uh, be uh, this law has also to be extended to cyber war and the cyberspace. So, for example, uh, the Geneva Convention might also be used or applied to the computer systems of a hospital. So, one. Uh, uh, party or one country that is attacking another country shall not be allowed to attack hospital computer systems and such. Um, actually, as with each and every law, um, laws have to be interpreted. And of course, there are different interpretations of the current uh, law of armed conflict. Um, the currently generally accepted interpretations say that cyber attacks are not an act of war. And therefore, uh, a country is not allowed to react with uh, a conventional warfare. So if uh, one country attacks another country with a cyber attack, the attacked country is not allowed to start its, uh, its air force and bomb down the capital of the aggressor. And there's also, um, there's also another point uh, that has to be met. Uh, to be an act of war, cyber attacks have to be conducted by governmental organizations or at least have to be supported by them. If there is no governmental organization involved in the attack, it cannot be an act of war, even if the, the attacked country is completely shut down. So if uh, private persons or maybe organized crime or the mafia, Yakuza or something else is attacking another country, this can never ever be an act of war, even if the attacked country is completely shut down. This is only an act of criminal, and this can only be punished by criminal, uh, by, by law enforcement communities, by police, and not by armies. Uh, 
Um, another point that is currently on discussion is non-proliferation of cyber weapons. Uh, a friend of mine is currently writing his PhD thesis in political science about non-proliferation of uh, uh, nuclear weapons, and he also has a chapter of non-proliferation of cyber weapons. So I helped him with some technical background. And uh, to enforce non-proliferation on an international level, um, international non-proliferation treaties are required. Uh, one of that, uh, one example for that is the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that, for example, forbids uh, countries who, also, uh, who already have uh, nuclear weapons to sell them to other countries who not already have nuclear weapons. That's the treaty that allows um, the United States to block uh, trading or to establish trading embargoes to Iran, South, uh, Northern Korea, or uh, Iraq. Um, some lawyers and political scientists are interested in establishing some kind of non-proliferation treaty. There have already speaks, uh, um, uh, consultations begun, for example, between the NATO or NATO and the US and uh, Russia and China, and they are currently discussing how to establish an international non-proliferation treaty for cyber weapons. But um, from the hacker or technical point of view, um, non-proliferation can almost not be enforced because. Uh, the internet cannot really be censored, and cyber weapons can be smuggled on, for example, SD disk or compact flashcards. So it's, it's very hard to actually enforce um, a, a trading ban on cyber weapons. And a cyber weapon can be any Linux distribution or BSD version or even Microsoft Windows uh, with uh, NMAP installed or something like that. And uh, uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear power plants are big plants. And they use big sites, and uh, there is a lot of a lot of machines are required to build in a nuclear power plant or nuclear weapon, but uh, cyber weapons can be smuggled with, uh, on any laptop uh, hard disk. And so it's very, very hard to physically uh, enforce uh, non-proliferation. Uh, cyber war is, of course, also currently discussed in the NATO, and the United States want to change the NATO treaty to allow conventional military reactions to cyber attacks. That would mean, to my for, uh, for, uh, before given example, that that 14-year-old Pakistani script kiddie might be able to shut down the US Air Force, pretending to be Chinese and provoking a conventional attack of China by all NATO members. And that would mean that we would, uh, within one day, start uh, a third world war, because all NATO states are required to support the United States if the NATO treaty is um, uh, change to allow conventional military reactions to cyber attacks. And as we know in the hacking scene, um, IP spoofing and such is quite easily done, so um, any well-trained hacker might be able to, to, uh, to spoof an, another identity and to spoof to being from another country, so he might be able to wage a cyber attack that is assumed to coming from uh, some, some other country than he lives in. And I guess that might happen even by other... Um, military organizations or secret services or such. So uh, changing the NATO treaty to allow conventional military reactions is, in my opinion, a big, big mistake because that might really lead to um, a third world war or at least to some bigger military problems. Um, there is another talk on DeepSec on cyber war versus cyber crime. I've also taken one slide on cyber crime. Uh, because um, legal definitions of cyber war and cyber crime have to be made. Uh, in my opinion, cyber crime is currently more dangerous than cyber war. All discussion, discussions about cyber war are more or less on a theoretical uh, level, not on a practical, because there is currently no possibility to, or it is not possible to wage a cyber war in, in, in real life. Um, an international, uh, as with a cyber war, an international cyber crime convention is required. There are international uh, crime conventions established like uh, uh, in, uh, Inpol and Europol and such, and there is also an international anti-cyber crime agency required that is allowed to act in cases of cyber crime because usually military powers or military forces are not allowed to uh, react to cyber crime or crime at all. And that's a point where uh, the lawyers and uh, lawyers have to, to create and establish treaties that uh, bring the countries and their discussions together. Yeah. Um, the third part of the talk will give an overview of attack vectors, and I will take a, a more political analysis of, for example, Stuxnet. Yeah, I guess Stuxnet is known to anyone here in DeepSec. Uh, it's a worm that has been created by some 
uh, very good programmers to uh, possibly attack the Iranian nuclear uh, program. Um, there has been an analysis of Stuxnet, a technical analysis of Stuxnet made by uh, Zumantech. It's available online as a PDF file, and the analysts said that Stuxnet was really expensive. It costs uh, um, several hundred thousand or million, up to one million dollars, and they required several good programmers and the management. So it's had, had, Stuxnet has not been programmed by a 14-year-old script kitty, but it has been made by uh, a well-organized group, probably a military group or a, a secret service or something like that, intelligence agency. Um, the developers of Stuxnet required a test bed, including industrial computers and control devices, which are very expensive and cannot be bought in a, in a, uh, in a supermarket. They have to be uh, bought from, from, from a big industrial um, firms and companies. Um, additionally, the Stuxnet developer used multiple zero-day exploits, which are expensive to find or even more expensive to buy. Um, there is a lot of cybercrime going on, and some hacker groups are selling uh, exploits to anyone who is interested in them and willing to pay for them. And uh, the analysts say that the guys who created Stuxnet possibly um, bought several zero-day exploits uh, with exclusive rights. And this is very expensive. It costs several million dollars to buy such a zero-day exploit, especially for very specialized industrial control computers, which are not that common. Um, additionally, Stuxnet used multiple intrusion vectors, including USB sticks, on very sensitive areas like nuclear research plants. It has been confirmed in the media that the uh, nuclear power plant in Boucher in Iran has been infected by Stuxnet. And that means that some kind of, of James Bond agent uh, invaded or intruded uh, the, the Boucher uh, power plant and dropped some USB sticks there or transferred uh, Stuxnet to the control computers there because all those control computers are not connected to the internet. So they had to use another um, intrusion vector. And all this analysis came to the conclu conclusion that this is not the work of some, some hacking group or some amateurs, but of professional, well-organized group, possibly military or intelligence agencies. So um, this one uh, put the discussion on cyber war, Stuxnet put the discussion on cyber war on a technical new level and also on a political new level. Um, it was... Yeah. Um, Stuxnet is, of course, a well-organized, strategically planned act of aggression. But the question when discussing it with Clausewitz is, did it, did it disarm an opponent and render him politically helpless or military impotent? Uh, Stuxnet might have harmed the Iranian uh, nuclear power plant program, but uh, it neither did render the Iran politically helpless or military impotent. impotent. And uh, as far as it is known in the media, uh, Stuxnet... Uh, failed in that way that it was discovered and was not able to shut down the uh, uranium production lines uh, that stand or are used in Boucher. So actually, if there ever was a strategic aim to shut down the Iranian nuclear power program, uh, Stuxnet completely failed. So uh, one, or I would say that Stuxnet is, is a, a well-organized hacking attack on a maybe s a tactical level, but it's not actually a part of cyber war or cyber war on its own. Um, there is another, another attack vector that will give us a lot of fun in the future, or nearby future. Uh, the attack vector is called smart meters. Um, the European com community wants intelligent electricity meters in all households uh, in the whole European Union. Uh, remote meters are used to measure the detailed amount of power consumption per household. Um, the intention by the European, com European community is to help save electric load and gather information for power plants. Uh, there is uh, the term of intelligent power nets, which, is currently, which are currently in, in development, and um, uh, the industry and the power plants are in interested in so-called smart meters. Uh, smart meters allow power plants to remotely shut down uh, a complete household and take them off the, the power consumption net. Um, this is usually uh, of interest for the power plants so they can take off uh, customers who don't pay for their, for their uh, consumed electricity and they can be shut down within a, with just a push of a button or just a remote lock-in and they cannot get any electric power anymore. 
but um, as one might already think, the, the whole uh, security discussion has never ever been applied to smart meters. Um, there is um, a somewhat theoretical uh, kind of attack. Um, if a lot of households are shut down at the same time, the cut of current might shut down the local power plant. So if you take out uh, a town like Vienna or Berlin or, or Paris or London, uh, the local power plants will uh, shut down or even explode because there is a, a very high uh, uh, current shutdown. Um, the shutdown of one local power plant produces more cut of current, so uh, the power plants attached or uh, cascaded after the local power plant might also shut down. And that would can create a cascading effect to the next power plants. And um, almost all European power plants are cascaded into one single network. So with shutting down enough households, one might be able to shut down the whole European power plant network, and thus leaving uh, the whole European Union without any electricity. Um, another interesting point uh, for the strategist or political scientist is the backup systems rely on natural gas, and almost uh, all parts of the European Union rely on natural gas that is supplied by one single country, Russia. So uh, one might uh, 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 think of a an, of an cyber war in the future or an attack in the future where um, uh, one country shut, shuts down the whole electricity in, in Europe and then simply cuts down the natural gas supply. And if this is done during winter, maybe on Christmas, we will have a big problem in Europe. Um, North Italy was shut down by an accident and a cascading effect uh, some years ago. It was not a cyber war attack, and no smart meters were uh, involved in that scene, but there was an accident in a power plant and that created a cascading effect, so several other uh, power plants uh, were shut down and the European power network had to cut off North Italy from its uh, lines. So they also used some kind of demilitarized, demilitarized zone and firewalls in the power plants and uh, the power network, and they had to cut off North Italy and leave it without uh, electricity for some hours or even a day. So this already happened. And some years ago, there was a big uh, power failure in the US where several power plants were also shut down. But that was also not uh, done by, by smart meters and cyber war, but still by uh, it was um, applied to, to uh, old technology and uh, uh, other problems in the US uh, power network. Um, I had a discussion with uh, some guys from the Vienna Technical University, which are just uh, analyzing uh, smart meters, and currently there is absolutely no IT security involved in the process. Smart meters are usually designed by electrical engineers, and they don't have, uh, I wouldn't say they have any clue of security, but they don't uh, discuss or keep IT security in mind. They're interested in electrical security, which is, of course, also a big topic, but um, all these smart meters are remote controllable, and they don't think of uh, how to prevent smart meters from getting uh, shut down by a denial-of-service attack, or how to prevent smart meters to become a botnet. Huh? Uh, in the UK, uh, the United Kingdom smart meters are currently rolled out, and there are about 47 million households. And Ross Anderson, a professor of IT security at Cambridge, um, wrote a paper on that topic. And he said uh, those 47 million smart meters might be turned into a botnet, because they are, of course, accessible via internet. And they can uh, attack uh, any other uh, IT system or an internet part in, in the UK. Um, for the political scientists, uh, scientists there's uh, another interesting point. A lot of power companies and industrial companies can make a lot of money. And therefore, they are lobbying for the introduction of smart meters. As with every uh, political process, the industry is interested in getting laws uh, that uh, help them, and currently they are lobbying to um, the introduction of smart meters. And the politics, uh, politicians usually don't have that clue on IT security, cyber war and such. Uh, and so uh, I think that smart meters will be introduced very soon. Or they are currently already being introduced in some countries. Uh, the smart meters are bloated by producers like Amex to make them expensive. Uh, if we are all forced to buy a smart meter, then um, it is uh, very, very good for the, for the producers to make smart meters as expensive as possible because we are forced to buy them. 
so they will get uh, a cash cow to make money from. And in my opinion, that process needs to be analyzed by political science. But unfortunately, political science, at least in Germany, uh, has some kind of fear of, of technology, and they are discussing uh, Cold War themes and, and topics and such, and, but they are not interested in technolo technological problems. And on the other hand, uh, the hacker scene or IT security is not that much interested in political processes. So in my opinion, political science, IT security science, and, and uh, hackers have to, to work together on that processes. Um, I will give another short outlook on, on other attack vectors that might show up in the future. Uh, Network-centric warfare is currently a central doctrine of the United States Armed Forces. Uh, the concept of network-centric warfare was created uh, in 1995. The first paper on network-centric warfare was published. And network-centric warfare is the idea of using data warehousing technology in the army. So uh, the, the general who created that concept said um, the IT has given uh, new um, ways to work to the economy, to the economic science, uh, during the 80s. So uh, that, that part of business informatics or business computer science, um, those concepts could be taken over and used by the military. So they want to use data warehousing, with, um, which heavily relies on electronic communication. One idea or one concept of network-centric warfare is that each and every soldier gets an uplink and a downlink to his command. So even the lowest ranking private that is running around with an assault rifle in a, in a forest uh, will have some kind of PDA or head-up display which is uh, uplinked to via, via satellite to his, um, to his uh, commander and he will also have a downlink to get commands from, or orders from his uh, commander. And as you might see, um, the whole concept of network-centric warfare heavily relies on electronic communication. And as we all know, electronic communication can be hacked and it can be hacked in a way that uh, military units, units are unable to act. So you can shut down maybe uh, an armored brigade of the US Marines by simply hacking the uplink and downlink. Or you can even uh, use a man in the middle attack to give them fake orders, to order them to another part of, 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 of country or something like that. Um, robotic warfare is also currently a big, big uh, topic in the cyber war scene. Um, all military, or at least all industrial states, are currently developing um, robotic warfare weapons. Uh, surveillance drones are currently used in Afghanistan. They are also used by police forces, for example, in London. Um, the military is very interested in getting some kind of Terminator. And, uh, of course, robotic warfare also heavily relies on electronic communication. And this communication can also be hacked. And uh, if uh, robotic warfare weapons or, or, or if weapons are uh, uh, electronificated or turned into robots, they can be hacked and taken over by your opponent. And uh, uh, that uh, can be done by, once again, the 14-year-old script kitty. So your complete armored brigade might be taken over by a well-trained hacker with a laptop and a Linux distribution. Uh, there's also another interesting thing. The, the East German uh, intelligence agency used so-called perspective agents. There was one case in the 1970s where uh, the East German intelligence uh, service installed an agent uh, in the office of the West German Chancellor. Uh, Günter Guillaume was the name of the East German agent, and Willy Brandt was then the West German um, agent, uh, Chancellor. And that uh, agent was uh, installed uh, 20 years ago. He was set up as a perspective agent. He was sent to, the, to West Germany from East Germany, and he was trained to to reach a high-ranking position within the political party that uh, the, the future chancellor was uh, in. And uh, this can also be, you know, this tactic can also be applied to Trojans. So it might be able to roll out a Trojan that works, or that, that uh, keeps quiet for several years, and in some years when a cyber war is waging, or when uh, two countries are, are arguing with each other, that Trojan might be used by your opponent or by a, an opponent uh, to shut down several systems or to take over systems. There is a project um, at my university that is discussing uh, security problems of electronics in car, uh, in uh, automobiles, and uh, they are currently using so much computers and so much electronics in, in cars um, that you can 
uh, actually hacks them and manipulate them. Uh, you can even remotely manipulate them. So uh, uh, you could now start to maybe hack a big car manufacturer like Toyota, Volkswagen, Mercedes or something else. And when it ever, whenever it comes to a war, you could use a big red button to shut down all cars used by your opponent because they have uh, an undiscovered Trojan on their electronic system. So there might be uh, very interesting new toys for all hackers and um, for the military. So um, to, to sum it up, this is my last slide. Um, the term cyber war is, in my opinion, a little bit exaggerated. We currently don't have the possibility to wage a cyber war uh, because it is currently not possible to render an opponent military impotent. But we are working towards a society that relies more and more on IT, electronics and such. And uh, we have absolutely no international strategy on IT security. So this discussion has to be led further by political science politicians, by IT security folks. Uh, we have to find an international strategy on IT security. And we also have to bring IT security to, to organizations and, and uh, engineers that are currently not using uh, or discussing IT security, like the electrical engineers designing power meters and smart meters. Um, we are currently in some kind of experimental phase, like the Air Force or the airplanes have been before the First World War. Um, there are several quotes from, from uh, generals from France, Germany, and, Lond uh, and England that said, we have absolutely no use for airplanes when the First World War started. And just 20 years later, the Second World War was completely decided by the air forces of the, of the nations. And um, the same happened, uh, at least in Germany, in the Second World War with the armored warfare, the Panzertruppe. Uh, the general uh, Erwin Rommel, also known as the Desert Fox, created a completely new tactics of how to use a panzer or, or tanks. And he overrun uh, France in just six weeks. And we are currently in exactly that, that uh, phase where people are in experimenting with the new weapons. And one day there might be that Rommel or someone else who brings a complete new use to IT uh, technology. And therefore, he might change uh, warfare as we currently know it. Uh, so my uh, advice is uh, you should have a look at Clausewitz. Clausewitz gives also a lot of good hints on strategy and tactics that are uh, useful if you're into IT security because most uh, IT security mechanisms or, or awareness campaigns and such don't have any strategy at all. Um, another book I suggest uh, to be read by anyone, Josef Weizenbaum. He just published one book. I currently don't know the English title but it's about the, the power of computers. We attribute to them. And there is another very interesting man, Martin van Krefeld. He is a professor of military science at the University of, if I remember correctly, Tel Aviv. He's living in Israel, and he is currently also discussing how cyber war might change all the Clausewitzian uh, signs of, of war, or how uh, cyber war should be discussed in a scientific way. Uh, Clausewitz's book on war is available via Project Gutenberg in German and also in English, so you can find it online uh, as a PDF or text, uh, since it has no copyright on it because it's too old for that. So I'm finished now. I would also uh, like to introduce that I'm a substitute speaker for the night talk. I will give a talk on security awareness, which is a completely different topic. So I will talk about the psychologi uh, psych psychology of uh, security in organizations. And I would like to finish my talk now, and we still have some time left for questions. Yes, we have some time for questions. First, let me thank you. Um, I think uh, that we start thinking about these issues uh, also as a society is worth it. So yes. I enjoyed the talk. And maybe you have got some questions from the audience. Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, how far do you think that cyber war could be going on right now as a part of the economic war? Think spionage, think economic spionage, oh. think that kind of dark stuff. Um, I think cyber war or, or electronic warfare is a big, big part and a big integral, pa integral part of uh, business warfare. And it also has been um, a part of it before the term cyber war was actually used. So even 20, 30 years ago, electronic warfare was used in economic war for espionage and such. There have been, uh, for example, biddings being interrupted on international projects and uh, 
uh, there has been there have been cases where electronic warfare has been used to to uh, weaken the economy of um, of a country or to to uh, do espionage against uh, um, a company. Maybe we should uh, stop using the term war for that, as you suggested, yeah. because I fear that some military um, hothead might start retaliate, as, as you uh, already said. So um, I think it's worthwhile to, to spread that, that it's not really, most of these issues are not really war. Yes. And so it doesn't, uh, retaliation with real war is a, a big danger, I think. Yes. And so maybe we should start talking about that as um, criminal I, I acts. Su I suggest to use the term electronic warfare on that. So it, 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 is my, it might be a part of, of conventional warfare, but cyber war is too exaggerated for it. Is it warfare? Is it? Yeah, at least in, in, in the German acts. army it's called electronic warfare. Okay. All the, the guys who are doing cyber war. And of course with UFOs. I think it, we should start talk in talking about criminal acts, but um. uh, I'm, I'm a bit missing the differentiation between uh, cyber crime, cyber terrorism, oh. and cyber war. Uh, and I'm not sure about uh, warfare in terms of, of state actors. Uh, right now, my fear is more on, on the non-state actors. And the attribution problem, which we didn't really mention here, um, Actually, that's uh, all the, the, the recent uh, international exercises I've seen didn't use states as the attacker or as the aggressor. Mm -hmm. They used non-state actors. Mm -hmm. um, the differentiation between cyber terror, cyber crime, and cyber war is, uh, as far as I see, only um, a legal problem. And and on a on a technical on a technical level, I don't see uh, that big difference if you are attacked by a terrorist or by a country or by an army. And uh, in, in political science or in politics, it's, it's only exclusively uh, a, a legal problem and a problem of treaties that have to be established. Yes, but... Uh, as far as I know, but I'm not a lawyer. If you're interpreting it as war, mm -hmm. you might retaliate with uh, real uh, mm -hmm. rockets or something. So yeah. I, I think it's it really... Um, we, we see that in the newspapers, the, the term cyber war is used very uh, inflationary. And um, I don't think it is. Um, so I, I'm with you in this point that today we, we don't have cyber war. Most of these actors in the game are non-state actors. Yes. And non-state act actors can legally not wage a war. At least nowadays. Maybe they change the treaties. Uh, one question to your example of smart meters. I. I did not catch why this should be a new threat, because in the end uh, you could switch off um, parts of the electric network uh, now by, by hacking the right um, big switch in the network. Why should I do the hard work and, and uh, shut down a lot of households when I can shut down all of them at once uh, now and not in the future? Um, it might be an, an, a new attack vector because um, it depends on how many different smart meters are rolled out. If the whole European Union, Union uses just one single model of smart meter and you will find a security hole in that, uh, you can write a, a worm or a virus that simply attacks these smart meters with, uh, with one single uh, 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 security hole. So it might be it might be easier to shut down smart meters than to hack into power plants, but that has to be seen in reality when they are installed and, and rolled out. This is yes, just a, a hypothesis. Yes, I, I don't believe that it will be such homogeneous uh, that all, uh, all companies will, all countries will after, be the same, but we'll see it. <laughs> uh, after the discussions I had with the guys from the technical university and after I got to know who which companies are involved in the smart meters, uh, I think uh, there might be big security problems with them, but that has to be checked once they are rolled out. They are already being rolled out in, in Austria, for example. If you if you have a, a solar photovoltaics uh, system, you get a smart meter today. Oh, so okay. I didn't know that. Any more questions? And thank you very much. Maybe there is uh, more time for discussions. Uh, 
for lunch or at the mm -hmm. break. Thank you very much.